You're watching now with Bill Moyers. With contributions from NPR News. Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. In Cochabamba, you had people who only had water one hour a day, one day a week. An American multinational giant thought it had the answer until the people stood up and rebelled. Housewives, people that you wouldn't believe that they could become violent, they were there. They were throwing stones against police. All over the world, water is the next gold rush. And the birth certificate of a nation brings Americans to tears. It's the people's document. They'll never have to hunt for where it is. It's coming to them. A modern patriot takes the declaration on the road, an interview with Norman Lear. Funding for now has been provided by our sole corporate funder. For over 50 years, we've put retirement and pension products to work for those in the public service. Now we're doing the same for the rest of America. Mutual of America, for all of America, the spirit of America. And by the Kohlberg Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. From our studios in New York, Bill Moyers. Welcome to Now. On this 4th of July weekend, we want to take you to where protest and dissent still matter. In 1776, it was a tax on tea that had stirred the rebellion. In our story tonight, it's the price of water. Yes, water. Where I live in New York, we take water for granted. Turn on the tap, and there it is on the cheap. You'd have a riot on your hands if you tried to auction it to the highest bidder. But elsewhere in the world, water is scarce and becoming as valuable as liquid gold. In the name of globalization, it's being argued that only the market can distribute this scarce commodity more efficiently, and water rights are being bought up by multinational corporations. Those who need water are pitted against those who want it for profit. Our report from Bolivia is a collaboration with the new PBS series Frontline World by producer David Murdoch and the New Yorker's William Finnegan. Who does water belong to? Who should control it? In a globalizing world, these questions drive an increasingly polarized debate. On one side are those who believe water is a public good, a human right, which cannot and should not be controlled by interests out for profit. People like Oscar Oliveira, a Bolivian labor organizer. God has given us water. It rains in the high country, it rains on the lakes, it rains on the fields. The only thing the water company should do is to help St. Peter get the water to the people so that we all are able to use it. On the other side are those who believe in the privatization of water, that the free market is the most efficient mechanism to deliver the water that people need. If you are genuinely concerned with them getting water, what is the best route to do that? It's a practical question, it's not a moral question. And a declaration that water is owned by the public, to be managed by the public for the good of everybody, we've had decades of that and it hasn't worked. I went to Bolivia because I'd heard about a conflict in which the forces of corporate globalization met fierce local resistance. It was a fight over water and it took place in a town called Cochabamba. Bolivia is blessed with great natural beauty but it's the poorest country in South America. 70% of its citizens live in poverty. Nearly one in every 10 children born here dies before the age of five. Since the 1980s, Bolivia has been financially dependent upon the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. These powerful institutions lend money to strapped governments with conditions, such as privatizing public assets on the assumption that where government has failed, the market will succeed. Bolivia's leaders have followed their instructions, dutifully selling off national industries, airlines, utilities, mines, railroads, to private companies, usually foreign corporations. Many Bolivians resent the idea that their country's policies are being dictated by outsiders. It's a very poor country, but we're 
Bolivia is a very poor country, but we are sitting on a chair of gold. We have gold mines, oil, gas, we have everything, but we sell it all off to other countries. The Bolivian economy got dramatically worse after the United States pressured Bolivia into eradicating its most lucrative export, coca, the leaf that could be turned into cocaine. Drugs, illegal as they may be, they were 3% of GDP. 18% of exports, that was the estimate we had. Uh, to put it in context, 3% of GDP in the U.S. is agricultural and mining sector combined. Jorge Quiroga is Bolivia's president. He's a former IBM executive with a degree in industrial engineering from Texas A&M. Illegal, illegal as it was, bad as it was, you know, damaging as it was, if you look at it from a purely business standpoint, mm -hmm. it was a business with high value added, going from coca to cocaine. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Milton Friedman or Hayek heaven, mm -hmm. all privately run, no taxation, no regulation. And in essence, if you want to look at it cynically, duty-free access to markets. Mm -hmm. As long as you're willing to lose part of the merchandise and seizures every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Politicians like Quiroga fully supported the coca eradication, but the loss of drug money only increased Bolivia's dependence on international financial institutions, particularly the World Bank. World Bank is the government in Bolivia and I think in, in many developing countries. There is no developing country that can get a foreign credit without the World Bank accepting it. So the World Bank said that all the countries that have a, a huge debt, well n from now on your water systems have to be privatized. If you don't do this you don't get money from uh, from international loans. In the 1990s, Bolivia put up for auction the water rights of its largest cities, including Cochabamba. Half of its 800,000 citizens were not yet hooked up to the city water system. Many were paying exorbitant prices for water delivered by trucks. Cochabamba looked like a perfect opportunity for foreign investment. But when the government put the city's water up for auction, only one bidder appeared a company created solely for the occasion called Aguas del Tunari. Doubts about the wisdom of the deal surfaced immediately. Among local environmentalists and peasant farmers, even the World Bank didn't support the plan. Why didn't the government stop the process? It, it was, it's necessary to, to, bring about, to bring private investment to develop the water, pro, to sure, attack the water. Sure, but at some point, the government seems, in retrospect, in a way, to have been at a terrible disadvantage with just this single bidder getting this contract. Uh, well, I, I think it's happened in, in several times. I mean, uh, Bolivia is not, the, uh, it's not the Brazil of the world where they're lining up to, to invest in different things, I think. We, we've had lots of processes where we wind up with uh, not as many bidders as we thought. Mm -hmm. Aguas del Tunari leased the Cochabamba water system for 40 years. It was a two and a half billion dollar deal. The contract promised the Bolivians improved service. It also guaranteed the company an annual profit of 15 to 17 percent. Then, two months after taking over the Cochabamba system, Aguas del Tunari raised water rates by as much as 200 percent. People making $80 a month were being asked to pay $20 a month just for water. As soon as the rate hikes went into effect, people took to the streets in protest. Graffiti began appearing on city walls. This one is typical. With the people mobilized, we will cancel the contract with Aguas del Tunari. Thieves. But who exactly was Aguas del Tunari? Jim Schultz, an American journalist and activist living in Cochabamba, undertook to find out. Nobody understood really who Aguas del Tunari was. Mostly what we knew was that Aguas del Tunari had a parent company that owned it and managed it, which was International Water Limited. So I went to their homepage to see if there was anything on their website that actually mentioned Bolivia by name. And it was from this page that we figured out that International Water Limited was founded in uh, 1996 by Bechtel. Bechtel was a name people knew. Based in San Francisco, it's a huge, privately owned engineering and construction company with vast political connections. In recent years, it's been getting into the world water business through its subsidiary, International Water Limited. 
And this was not something that the press here had reported. Nobody, nobody understood who International Waters was. Nobody understood really who August Del Tenari was. To Schultz, it appeared the Bechtel Corporation had come to town under an assumed name. All around Cochabamba, people were meeting to talk about water. We are the owners of these fields. We own the roads. We used to own the oil wells and the airlines and the railroads. Oscar Oliveira, who was once a shoe factory worker, was now one of the most effective organizers against the water privatization. We once owned the mines, but they've been taking everything from us little by little, my brothers. Oscar Oliveira is a very respected labor leader in Cochabamba. One or two years before the revolt, he already told me water is going to be the, mm -hmm. the thing. Mm -hmm. And he, had, he, was, he was right. Mm -hmm. He was right. Oliveira understood that selling off a water system is not like selling off a phone company. Water isn't manufactured. It falls freely from the skies. It's essential to life. In Cochabamba, peasant said Bechtel was trying to lease the rain. Cochabamba's water problem has worsened over the last 25 years as hundreds of thousands have moved into the city from rural areas and smaller towns. The water system has been overburdened and the water table beneath the city is dropping rapidly. Many of Cochabamba's new residents moved to the city after losing their jobs when national industries were privatized. In the market district, You'll find displaced miners, factory workers, and farmers jammed together, hawking cheap foreign-made products. Cochabamba's ever-expanding market district now takes up 25 blocks in the center of the city. The neighborhood of San Miguel is filled with migrants from depressed mining areas. Freddy Villa Gomez showed me around. Todo esta cuadra, somos paisanos de un solo pueblo. This whole block is family and people from my village. For example, in this house is my cousin, then another cousin, then my house, and above that another family, all from the same village. Like many of Cochabamba's neighborhoods, they've never been hooked up to the water system. So, eight years ago, the residents of San Miguel took matters into their own hands and dug themselves a well. This was the well that was finished in 1997. All of us from the neighborhood built it by working together. Everyone is a group, so it belongs to all of us by right, because we all invested our hard work in this well. We fought a lot and sacrificed a lot to build it. Right now, 210 families get water from this well. A single tap provides water for all the household needs of Freddy's father on hell. This barrel we use for washing clothes. That one is to store our drinking water. We wash ourselves in the sink here. And since this is a poor neighborhood, the sewage goes out into the street. <laughs> Even in parts of the city that were hooked up to the network, Cochabamba's water service was always inconsistent. I think it's very difficult for Americans to understand this because we have water 24-7. But it, in Cochabamba, you had people who only had water one hour a day, one day a week. You had others who had water eight hours a day, seven days a week. If we can provide a public service in providing safe, secure water supplies to people. We're doing this in Estonia, in Manila, in Bulgaria, uh, we see no reason why we could not have done it in Cochabamba. The government wanted to expand the city's water network, but according to Aguas del Tunari, it simply couldn't afford to. Cochabamba operated at a loss of better than a two and a quarter million dollars a year for the past five years, six years. They have debts of $35 million. They're running a deficit. How can they possibly expand their water under those conditions? So they have now turned to the private market to do that. In so doing, 
the rates charged for those services have to be increased to where they cover at least cost. With rates soaring, people in Cochabamba felt the company wasn't just covering costs, it was gouging them. The demonstrations grew. The streets of Cochabamba filled with protesters. Word spread that not only were rates going up, but Aguas del Tenari could start charging people for water it didn't even provide, including the water from privately dug wells, like the one I saw in San Miguel. When word got around that the wells would pass into the hands of Aguas del Tunari and they could start charging us for the water, the people took action. Freddy Villagomez joined a group of protesters blocking roads going into town. This whole road was blocked. There was a big tree here that they dragged out with a tractor. Then they piled an old car on top of that. Nothing, nothing could pass. The water protests were becoming a water war. We have protests every day in Bolivia. They go on hunger strike very often, or they can even crucify themselves, and nothing happens. But this time was different. Housewives, people that you wouldn't believe that they could become violent. They were there, they were throwing stones against police. Everybody was protesting, everybody. We have always repeated those slogans, death to the World Bank, death to the IMF, down with Yankee imperialism. But I believe this is the first time that the people understood in a direct way how the policies of the World Bank, free trade, free market, are putting us at such a disadvantage among the most powerful countries. Aguas del Tenari's initial response to the protest was blunt. If people didn't pay their water bills, their water would be cut off. The response of the government fearing the demonstrations would threaten foreign investment in Bolivia was blunter still. Cochabamba's water war expanded to include the rest of the country and a multitude of concerns. Demonstrations broke out over indigenous people's rights, police wages, official corruption. On April 7th, 2000, the government declared a state of siege. Though a major American corporation was at the center of the Bolivian unrest, not a single U.S. newspaper had a reporter on the scene. And yet, news of the uprising was reaching a worldwide audience through the Internet. The source was an electronic newsletter with thousands of readers, written by the American who had pursued the Bechtel connection, Jim Schultz. He was in the streets during the uprising and filing daily accounts about events in Cochabamba. I was really taken aback by how powerful this was. Not just as a story, but that it was something we could communicate and get around to so many thousands of people. So then the question was, how do we put pressure on the company? One of my readers sent me a note and said, you know, I can get you the CEO's personal email address. So within about 24 hours, we were able to give thousands of people in the United States the personal email address of the head of Bechtel and people started, in states, started bombarding Bechtel with emails telling them basically that they should get out of the country. It was the only way that they were going to stop the violence in Bolivia was if they left. Meanwhile, in the streets of Cochabamba, the water war was about to turn deadly. A local TV camera caught an army sharpshooter in civilian clothes firing into a crowd of unarmed protesters. Victor Hugo Daza, a 17-year-old student, was in the crowd. He was hit in the face and died instantly. <laughs> it was becoming clear that there was no future for Aguas del Tunari or Bechtel in Cochabamba. The company executives fled the city. Celebrations broke out in the streets. balcony of his union office, Oscar Oliveira announced victory. 
y así lo hemos conseguido, compañeros. But did anyone really win Cochabamba's water war? Late last year, Aguas del Tunari filed a claim against the Bolivian government, seeking more than $25 million in compensation. The case will be heard in Washington, D.C., in a trade court run by the World Bank. We're not looking for a windfall from Bolivia. We're looking to recover our costs. Now, we can also claim lost profits. We may do so. Uh, that's a very large number. The government is fighting the suit, insisting the company spent less than a million dollars in Bolivia. <laughs> President Quiroga remains a champion of foreign investment, but in the wake of the violence, it's hard to find foreign investors. If this is considered too risky, mm -hmm. they'll go away. And then we'll have declarations of human rights and all these good things, mm -hmm. and no one will have any water. You know, I think that's a tragedy because the countries need investment, they need um, uh, expertise, they need all of these things. These are all healthy things to have. In Cochabamba, the water warriors who chased out Bechtel took control of the water system, vowing to treat water as a human right, not as an ordinary commodity. But without new investment, they're unable to expand the network or improve service. They're searching for a new model something between state control and the private market. Neither the Bolivian government nor the World Bank has any plans to help them. All over the world, there have been outbreaks of protest against globalization like those we just saw in Bolivia. My next guest knows firsthand about those protests, and she's written a book on why people have taken to the streets. It's called The Silent Takeover, and it's already a bestseller in England where the Sunday Times of London named it one of the year's best. Norena Hertz was born in England, received her MBA from the Wharton School of Business in Philadelphia, and her PhD in economics from the University of Cambridge, where she's associate director of the Center for International Business. Ten years ago, she was helping Russia organize its first stock market. Welcome to now. Thank you. Tell my audience what you mean by the silent takeover. Governments have been ceding power to big multinational corporations and the market. We see this manifest in a variety of ways, where governments are giving up power to big international institutions like the World Trade Organization or NAFTA, which are disabling government's ability to protect the rights of their own people. How much is the real issue those international finance uh, institutions that you talk about, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the World Trade Organization? I mean. To whom are they ultimately accountable? The Economist of London says that the World Trade Organization is an embryo world government, which no one has voted for. Now, how much are they the problem? Well, the World Trade Organization is an organization that defends trade interests. I think the problem is less that they exist. The problem is, internationally, we've only got an organization that protects trade interests. Surely we need some kind of counterweight to protect human rights and the environment, too. In Bolivia, we saw that effort at privatization. Is, would you place that under the category of uh, the silent takeover? Well, that's a case of public utilities, public goods, being increasingly handed over to private enterprises to run. Now, there's nothing wrong, per se, with things being handed over to the private sector to run if you had, for example, a really strong regulator in place. But take the situation in Bolivia. Those people before Bechtel arrived there did not have good, clean water. Bechtel was trying to set up a system that would deliver them safe, clean, and abundant water. I mean, do you think that the effort at privatization of that natural resource was, was wrong? Well, Bechtel was trying to set up a situation that would realize to its corporation profit, um, which, you know, is not necessarily the same thing as delivering clean water to everyone out there. It is the natural task of a corporation to gather the capital needed for projects that cannot come elsewhere. I mean, why shouldn't the corporation, in tandem with the government of Bolivia, be trying to, do, to capitalize that, that, that water project? There's nothing wrong with what a company is doing. Companies have to realize profit to their shareholders. In fact, they have a legal responsibility to do so, their fiduciary duty. It's the responsibility of states to ensure that in that process, 
the poor are still being served and looked after. In Bolivia, the price of water doubled almost overnight. A quarter of an average Bolivian salary could, uh, was now to be spent on accessing water. So it's not that there's anything necessarily wrong with private companies providing these functions. It's just that when you have a weak state, no regulator, no competition, and you leave it to companies, the poor, the marginalized, will often be the losers. You, you s talk very sensibly, you talk very reasonably, and yet the subtitle of your book is a very dire one, Global Capitalism and the Death of Democracy. What do you see that justifies such a dark description? Well, I think if we look at patterns of voter turnout over the past decade, we see this real disillusionment, lack of faith in governments. 75% of Americans believing that big business has more influence over their lives than government. Part of the problem is the embeddedness that big business now has with politics funding of political parties, campaign finance. You're talking to a true believer <laughs> on that. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that creates huge conflicts of interest. George W's environment policy clearly dictated by the interests of the energy companies that bankrolled his campaign. So part of what would be needed would be the disenfranchisement of corporations, would be the that? breaking of the financial stranglehold that big business has on politics. What does this do for what you call in your book the social contract? Well, it completely destroys the social contract, this idea that government and citizens together um, have a relationship to provide public goods, a sense of community, a better world. The social contract has been privatized. It's been handed over to the private sector to safeguard with incredible conflicts of interest. Scientific research Scientific research, something that you know, we want to be able to trust, to believe in, increasingly being funded by private corporations. When the FDA tried to remove saccharin off the list, or decided to remove saccharin off the list of cancer-inducing chemicals, its work was based on the findings of a University of Nebraska researcher who was funded by Sweet and Low. And therefore? And therefore the conflict is we can't even trust the information we now receive. We need to have much clearer regulations on things like corporate funding of scientific research. Things need to be made explicit that are implicit. We don't want the takeover. We shouldn't allow the takeover to be kept silent any longer. Have you been out to any of the protests, the protests in Seattle or Genoa or um, uh, in Quebec? Yeah, I was, um, the last protest I was at was in Genoa where I got tear gassed and, and I hate tear gas and I hate being in crowds. But, um, Why were you there? Because I'm really supportive of the protest movement because I think it's capable of changing the political agenda and because we already see signs of its success. In Europe, Guy Verhofstadt, the president of the European Union when he was, talked about a need for global binding agreements on ethics and the environment. He hosted a one-day session last October to which he invited me, um, other people who are seen as voices of the movement, but also Bill Clinton. Have, have you seen any evidence, though, Ms. Hertz, that, that the protests are actually making a dent yes. in the market ideology, the globalization that girdles the world? Yes. I see it in terms of changing political rhetoric in the United Kingdom. Gordon Brown, our Chancellor of the Exchequer's willingness now to double Britain's aid to least developed countries. And I see it on the lips of every CEO of every big company I see today. They're all saying we cannot ignore the voices of this protest movement. One third of CEOs of big multinationals polled say that they view the anti-globalization movement as a serious threat. Who's on the side of those people in Bolivia? The people in Bolivia, unfortunately, only have each other. But the international activist community is doing something in keeping their story alive. As we saw in the film, it's an activist who through the internet and using technology for globalization in a positive way managed to get the story of Bolivia across to yeah, very many constituencies. But unless a Bill Finnegan goes there, the mass media pay no attention to that sort of thing. And that is the tragedy of our times. That's the tragedy of a public information environment that is increasingly being commercialized. It's so hard to get those kind of stories on the airwaves. Broadcasters are so desperate for ratings, 
for advertising revenues, but they don't really want to run stories about the poor somewhere else or is that even why the poor you say, at home. Is that why you say in your first chapter, the revolution will not be televised? The revolution may not be televised, but word of the revolution is getting out. I was going to say, you're too young to be a pessimist. Are you a pessimist? Oh, no, I'm very optimistic. I think that we already see signs that the world is changing. I think in the context now in the United States of Enron, of Tyco, of Adelphia, that 75% of Americans who already thought that big business had too much influence over their lives is beginning to say, you know what? Hey, maybe it's not such a good thing that these big corporations are running amok. So I think we're seeing a groundswell descent, and we're seeing the mainstreaming of a lot of these ideas. Well, thank you very much for joining us on now, and thank you for the silent takeover. Thank you. It shouldn't surprise Americans when people rise up to protest a foreign power's encroachment on their rights. We started it all because of a multinational company called the East India Company, backed by the British Crown. Here's our call to arms, the Declaration of Independence, a single sheet of parchment that became the birth certificate of rebellion. The one you see here is the only copy in private hands. It belongs to Norman Lear the Emmy Award-winning producer of All in the Family and other television hits, and the founder of the advocacy group People for the American Way. He paid $8.2 million for this copy of the document, and like every good showman, he's taking it on the road from the Super Bowl to the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. Norman Lear is with me now. He's a longtime friend, a patriot known to shed a tear when the flag unfurls. Welcome to now. Thank you. Happy to be here, Bill. Why did you buy? this copy of the Declaration? Because I had read that it was going to be auctioned off by uh, Sotheby's and learned that it was three blocks away uh, in Los Angeles. Walked over at lunchtime uh, to look at it. Started to cry a bit. At uh, what? What were you crying about? Not the price. It, well, you used the expression birth certificate. Uh, birth certificate of the United States. The United States of America, written July 4th, 17 and 76 the, for the very first time and, and it, it goes back in my life to a grandfather uh, if you got a minute I'll tell you about my grandfather my grandfather I lived with him for a couple of years when my dad had a problem and uh, I was uh, shunted to my grandparents my grandfather loved this country uh, stood held, holding my hand so tightly it hurt on street corners when the parade uh, a parade went by and they went by often, you know, July 4th, uh, Veterans Day, President's Day, there were always parades. And he wrote the president. The president and, of the United States? Uh, he wrote, he was an inveterate letter writer to the president. And so uh, I lived with him, I heard these letters, he read them to me. Every letter started off, my dearest darling, Mr. President. <laughs> Don't you listen to them when they say such and such and so and so and so, to, you know, giving them advice. And when he disagreed, which was rare, but when he disagreed, he wrote, my dearest darling, Mr. President, didn't I tell you last week? And he would <laughs> read them to me with this inflection. But I would go downstairs, three flights, 74 York Street, New Haven, Connecticut, and in that little bronze uh, uh, mailbox, every now and again, this little white postcard that said White House. And my nine, ten-year-old heart would just, I couldn't get over it. So did you feel the same evocation when you stood in front of this document? Every bit of it. Every bit of it. And, and instantly thought, people's document, it will travel. If I'm lucky enough to secure it, it's the people's document. They'll never have to hunt for where it is. It's coming to them. And you've been taking it on the road, as I said earlier. What's yeah. been the reaction out there? Well, it's phenomenal. You know, in our culture, if you pay a lot of money for something, you get a lot of press. <laughs> <laughs> we ask your team for some reactions from the people who were coming to, have been coming to see the Declaration of Independence. Let's look at what they gave us. We can actually look at the document that set in place uh, America. You know, you grow up learning about it in school and stuff like that, and then actually see it, to hold it, 
it just kind of touches a little deep, you know. It just really means what this country's, you know, standing on. It really stood a standard for a lot of uh, revolutions around the world. I definitely believe that it will inspire people, especially my generation, by having them realize that they're empowered to reclaim their freedom. And it just brought this heartfelt feeling. This was in, uh, it's in Salt Lake City at the Winter Olympics. There were well over 100,000 people who came to see it. It sits in a bed of 1,000 pounds of stainless steel that kids can come up over and, and, and look at, uh, see the document at close hand. Is it possible that we are more sentimental about it than we are devoted to living it out these days? Any danger of that? I think the culture has trivialized uh, our point of view about such things. The last line of the document, you know, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. The words sacred honor. Where in our culture do we propagate the notion or do we help kids understand the, the beauty of the words uh, and the proposition sacred honor? You know, I often think you have to go to the, uh, the Godfather. You know, you have to go to places like the Godfather to find that people who, who are, for wrong reasons, pledging sacred honor. So what do you mean by sacred honor? What do you think they mean, and do you mean what they mean? I think sacred honor means if I say to you, count on me, you can count on me. As simple as that. If I say I'll be there, if I say you matter to me, you can count on it. Did your heart leap with joy? Uh, last week when the, when the federal court in California said that the Pledge of Allegiance is unconstitutional because that phrase, one nation under God, uh, violates the separation of church and state. Were you pleased with that? I, I won't say I was pleased. I wasn't upset. As ceremonial deity, somebody used that phrase, uh, some great thinker. The, the Senate says, uses the word God in the first sentence of prayer every morning. Uh, I, that doesn't trouble me. You think it would surprise people, particularly uh, people on the religious right, to know that the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a Christian socialist? <laughs> I think it would surprise them very much as it does me. It was. In fact, uh, he originally had in it equality, justice for all, equality and justice for all, but the superintendent of education on his commission uh -huh. uh, did not believe women and African Americans were equal, so he took that out. But as a Christian socialist, the words under God were added. 1950, 1954, after a campaign by the Knights of Columbus. So these, our friends on the right, the Protestants, mm -hmm. conservative Protestants, are pledging allegiance to an oath written by a socialist and right. the Catholic. You know, interesting, the word conservative, because there are some times when I think, who's, who's really the conservative? I hold a, a very narrow view about, you know, my First Amendment, my Bill of Rights. Don't mess with my Bill of Rights. Isn't that a conservative point of view? It's very focused. It's very narrow. I would think very conservative. What do you mean, my Bill of Rights? It's mine. How so? It's, this is my country. This is my flag. That's my president. This is my Bill of Rights. That's what my grandfather uh, would say were he sitting here and I'm speaking through him. What is written in the Declaration, Norman, in today's terms that is still revolutionary, that still is important to remember? All men are created equal endowed by their creator with the rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. If one takes those words very seriously and then examines all of the policy that's necessary to make those words real, Do you think we, we haven't made good on all these promises. One doesn't hear that much anymore, the word equality. Do you think that idea is still revolutionary? And is it been... I, I think equality before, we're, we're not certainly all equal. We don't all run as fast. We're not always as smart. We, you know, we, there are lots of differences. But equality before the law, I think, I think nine out of ten people would tell you they believe totally. I, th I think ten out of ten people would tell you they believe totally. When it came to what is necessary to uh, ensure that, that's where the differences come. You, know, you have lived through over one-third of this country's history. Uh, you've won some and you've lost some. How do you feel about the country this Fourth of July weekend? You know, I don't want to wake up the morning. I don't have hope, and I don't think that's only the re that's the only reason why I have hope. It, it the co-chairs of the Declaration of Independence project are, are Presidents Ford and Carter, 
uh, among the on the board are Lady uh, Bird Johnson and uh, and Nancy Reagan, and I'm here. Everybody knows me to be progressive or liberal or whatever the term they care to use, but we collect around this document and those basic ideas. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, created equal. I couldn't be prouder of that, and, and that and the people's response to the document give me great hope. What do you think is America's greatest contribution to political science? I think the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. The protection of the individual the, conscience. The protection of the individual conscience, of the right to speak, of the right to gather, the right to uh, protest. Uh, you think I mean, we do much protesting? I don't think we do enough protesting. I don't think we do enough protesting. And when we do, we hear from the establishment that, for, for all kinds of reasons, that perhaps we're doing the wrong thing. We're not going along. Well, America isn't about going along. America is about being heard. So this is still a revolutionary country? In that respect, it is still a revolutionary country. May it never change. Thank you very much, Norman. Thank you. The author of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, thought every new generation of Americans should revisit the revolution and test it against the new realities, recreating it in their own experience. Frank Wu is doing just that. He's the son of immigrants and teaches at the Howard University School of Law in Washington, D.C. We invited Frank Wu to be our commentator on this 4th of July weekend. I remember how much fun it was when I was growing up to see the fireworks on the 4th of July. My parents would bring my brothers and me to the local high school in our Detroit suburb. My father reminded us that fireworks had been invented in China. My parents were born there but they fled the communists and eventually found their way to the United States, seeking hope and opportunity. They had faith in the American dream. If I came home from school and told them the kids had picked on me, they'd tell me I should try harder to fit in. I thought they blamed me. I'm ashamed to admit it now, but I was embarrassed of them then. They had accents, they ate funny smelling foods, they didn't laugh at the right time when watching TV, and they needed my help writing a letter. There was a problem with the phone company. I realized only recently my parents blamed themselves, not me. In their daily lives, they faced everything I did, but they accepted it as their own fault. They assumed that they had brought the problems on themselves because they had accents. They figured that since I knew American culture, I would be accepted automatically within it. Over time, I've come to understand the debt I owe my parents. They did something I would never dream of doing. They moved halfway around the world, not for their future, but for mine. Yet even as I try to follow my parents' example of studying and working hard, I doubt I'll turn out to be just like them. Immigrants and their children are bound to make different choices. My parents believe that the nail that sticks up is pounded down. I believe the squeaky wheel gets the grease. My parents never protested about civil rights for themselves or anyone else because they literally didn't know the language. I care about civil rights and equality and freedom of speech and dissent not just for myself, but because we need principles to guide a diverse democracy. A little controversy is a good thing, a patriotic thing. I'm my parents' child, but I'm an American too. I like to light my own fireworks, and I want them to go off with a bang. And now we look at stories coming up on NPR Radio this weekend. Hi, I'm Scott Simon. Tomorrow morning on Weekend Edition from NPR News, we'll visit a tiny land near the Black Sea that some people believe was the original Garden of Eden. We'll find out how libertarians feel about national security and civil liberties. And Daniel Pinkwater and I will read a new version of a controversial old children's book, Little Black Sambo. You can find your local public station on our website, npr.org. Hope you can join us tomorrow. Now, my colleague from NPR News, Scott Simon, talks to West African musical sensation Angelique Kidjo. 
Angelique sings as easily in French as she does in English, not to mention her native West African language of Fon. But the singular voice of Angelique Kidjo is recognized all over the world for its effortless beauty. Uh, Dave Matthews has said that if God had a voice, it would sound like Angelique. Her seventh solo album has just been released. It's called Black Ivory Soul, and it explores the people and culture of the Brazilian state of Bahia. It's the second in a planned trilogy about the African diaspora, and we are pleased to welcome Angelique Kijo. Thanks very much for being with us. It's my pleasure. Black Ivory Soul, maybe we should explain. Black Ivory was a term that was used in the slave trade, wasn't it? Yeah, slavery used to be called like that. I wrote the song in 1999, being more focused on the soul, talking about our soul. We need our soul to be strong. We need our soul to be filled with joy, happiness, and love, and strength for us to stand on our bare feet, being proud of being a human being. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be a human rights lawyer when you first got to Paris? Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Since I was a child, man, I hate injustice. I can't stand it. It just turned my head upside down. Are you trying to accomplish some of the same things with your music as, as you envisioned accomplishing if you yeah, become a human rights lawyer? that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get my culture to be known by the whole world because in my culture, the traditional music teaches me tolerance, accepting other people's difference. When you come from a different country, and you come with an instrument they are playing, mm -hmm. they say, come and sit and play with us. It's not a matter of your color. It's not a matter of your language. It's a matter of how your spirit, your soul can join their soul, and you can get together and play music. We don't talk to each other. We don't interact that much with each other. What I'm trying to do with my music is to bring people to realize that, OK, this is the beginning of a step for us to go together, yeah. to start talking to each other. Now, when you recorded Black Ivory Soul, uh, musicians from all over the world were yeah. there, and you, and you recorded it live. What was funny and really interesting and uplifting was to see that the music, once again, make every boundaries disappear, because the drummer is from Philadelphia. I put the percussion player from Bahia. Yeah. He doesn't speak a word of English. The electric bass player, I flew him from Paris. He's from the French West Indies, from Martinique. And you have three guitar players. One from Guinea-Bissau, West Africa, and well, two from Well, we're fortunate Brazil. to have them with us in the studio today. Now we get to hear your band perform the song Tumba.
You like that one? I love Tumba. <laughs> I was very careful to write down the lyrics because I thought they must be significant. And I'm told they say, get yourself ready for dancing. I'm waiting for you. Definitely. That's yeah. what I said. Even though in the public, some people might be very self-conscious about themselves, not being ready to dance. I'm telling them in that song, even, if the, even though you don't want it, you got to dance. Let it loose. Yeah. Let your body go and free your body for your mind to be free. Mm. So that's a kind of liberation, isn't it? It is, definitely. When you dance, and you come out of it, you go, oh, I feel good. I wonder about this. You live in Brooklyn now. Yes. And um, when we open the newspapers in the United States and we see Africa in a headline, it, it almost always, it, it, at least it seems to me, crisis, uh, urgency, emergency, words like that, you can, you can count on being in the same headline. Is there something in your music that reveals another part of Africa you'd like people to know about, too? Yeah, the song Africa, for example. What I'm saying in that song is that if we African people, we don't think the best for ourselves, for mm -hmm. our continent, nobody else will do. It's easy to be sitting down and saying Africa is in a bad shape. But we have to refuse that thought. We have to refuse that attitude because it's in our hand to make it better. And it's true that every time you open a newspaper, what you hear about Africa is not a great thing. And every day in Africa, people woke up. I know people that wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and work hard and went to bed at 8 with a bowl of rice as a result at the end of the day. But that doesn't keep them away from hoping. That doesn't take away the joy and the happiness they have. You come to that house that day. They will share that bowl of rice with you. That's what Africa is. That's what keeps me going. Because I know that my people, if they have the opportunity, will make it good for themselves. That opportunity has never been given to any country in Africa since what they call independence happened. As I understand it now, we're going to see you and your group perform Africa, your song that's on the CD. Thanks very much for being with us. It's a pleasure. Now with Bill Moyers continues at PBS Online. Learn more about the people and issues from tonight's show and join the online discussion at pbs.org. To order this episode of Now with Bill Moyers on video cassette, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 Play PBS.
Funding for now has been provided by our sole corporate funder. For over 50 years, we've put retirement and pension products to work for those in the public service. Now we're doing the same for the rest of America. Mutual of America, for all of America, the spirit of America. And by the Kohlberg Foundation, the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS stations from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS.